Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, my name is John Miller, and I'm currently serving as the chairman of the Elder Board here at Christ First, and I have the privilege of speaking to you today. Several months ago, when Pastor James first asked me if I would preach today, he told me I could choose whatever passage of scripture I wanted to preach on. Now, for some people, that'd be great. The chance to choose any topic or passage from the Bible you want to talk about would be an amazing opportunity. For me, not so much. I much prefer to be told what verses I should preach on. Give me the verses, I'll read them, I'll reread them, I'll study the commentaries, see what the scholars say about the verses, I'll pray about the verses. When I'm done praying about them, I'll pray some more. The idea of picking my own verses completely intimidates me. I don't even know where to begin when it comes to making that choice. However, I said yes when James asked me if I'd be willing to preach this morning because it was another door God was asking me to walk through. You see, three years ago, James first asked me to consider preaching here at Christ First, and the thought of it scared the living daylights out of me. My only previous preaching experience had been 40 years earlier as a, ner as a nervous 17-year-old during youth night at church. But I said yes. After I preached that first sermon here, which was an experience that stretched me and challenged me in ways I'd never been challenged before, I prayed that God would continue to open doors for me to serve him, that he would give me the courage to walk through those doors when he opened them. So, if having to choose my own scripture to preach on was going to take me out of my comfort zone, if it was another door God was opening, it was time for me to put on my big boy pants and walk through that door. The first thing God impressed on me was that I wouldn't be choosing my own verse, verses to preach on. He had already chosen the passage for me, and it was my job to wait on him until he showed me what it would be. With time, it became clear to me that I was to speak to you today about Galatians 6.10. The reason it became clear to me was that because of something my brother went through recently, but I'll tell you more about that a little bit later. Meanwhile, I encourage you to open your Bibles this morning to Galatians 6.10. It's a verse I would imagine is very familiar to most of you. Galatians chapter 6, verse 10. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. It's a simple statement. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. However, as with most scriptures, there's more there than first meets the eye, and I'd like to take some time to unpack that verse this morning. But first, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. It is living and breathing, and it has the power to transform us. We ask that you open our hearts and minds to learn from it this morning. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. Let's start with the first statement in the verse, as we have opportunity. Pastor and author John McCarthy describes the statement this way, opportunity doesn't refer to just occasional moments. The believer's entire life provides the unique privilege by which one can serve others in Christ's name. It reminds me of the oft-repeated saying, today is God's gift to you, but how you use it is your gift to him. Think back any day from this past week and ask yourself this, did I honor God with my time? Did I use my time to make an impact and a difference? Or did I use my time to worry about things I can't control? When I ask you these questions, I am first and foremost asking them of myself. And if I'm being honest, I'll have to say, I wasted way more time than I should have. Believe it or not, God actually cares about what we do with our time because it's not really our time. It's time that he has given us. He's given us all the moments of our lives for a reason. And if we want to make them count, we have to take advantage of every opportunity and not allow them to pass us by. What Paul is saying in this verse is that God gives us opportunities for his glory. Let me repeat that. God gives us opportunities for his glory. Matthew 5.16 tells us in the same way let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. We are to live our lives in such a way that our words and actions point others toward God. That's the plan God has to bring people into a saving relationship with him. He uses believers to show the light of Christ to others. There is no backup plan. Let's look at the next part of the verse. Let us do good to everyone. It raises the question, what does it mean to do good? Paul doesn't go into specifics, and I think that was intentional on his part. Paul is not the judge of what is good or bad, so he alone cannot define it. However, 
As you read through other parts of his letter to the Galatians, you'll see that Paul does give some basic principles to live by as we strive to, good, to do good to others. Chapter 5, verse 25, tells us to walk in the Spirit. This means to walk in total submission to the Spirit. It means honoring God with our time so that we allow the Spirit to lead us on what it is we need to do. Now, it doesn't need, mean we have to ask the Spirit where we should have lunch on any given day, but it means we should ask the Spirit to show us who we can help that day. Chapter 6, verse 1, tells us to show care and concern for others. Specifically, it tells us we should restore those who are caught in sin, and we should do so in a spirit of gentleness. You see, in Paul's day, there were many religious people who took pride in their ability to do right and look down on those who did wrong. In this verse, Paul is saying that instead of judging those who have sinned, we are to look for opportunities to help restore them back into health in Christ. Chapter 6, verse 2 tells us that we should bear one another's burdens. This is the same idea expressed in Philippians chapter 2, verse 4. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Through the story of the Good Samaritan told in Luke chapter 10, Jesus made it clear that the question we should ask is not, who is my neighbor, but to whom can I be a neighbor? The point being made is this. Most of what we go through in life is not just for our benefit, but is to help someone else. So what does do good look like? Among other things, it means being sensitive to the Spirit's leading as to how we can help others. It means to lovingly seek to restore those who have fallen into sin. It means to come alongside others to help them bear their burdens. This brings us to the last part of today's verse, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Paul is very clear we are to do good to everyone, but especially to fellow believers. John chapter 14, verse 35 tells us, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. One commentator interprets that verse this way, their mutual love would be the strongest possible argument for the Christian faith. John MacArthur states, our love for fellow Christians is the primary test of our love for God. So once again, we are here to point others toward God, and one of the most important ways we can do that is by letting others see the love and care we have for one another as believers. So let's put it all back together. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. I started by telling you I was led to choose this verse by something that recently happened in the life of my brother. Let me tell you about my brother, Peter. He is three and a half years younger than me, and he is quite a character. When it comes to humor, some people like to take things as far as they can without crossing the line. Peter will run right up to the line and then gleefully jump right over it. I still think of the time that a secretary at my work would look me in the eye when I asked her about a phone message left for me by a doctor that I didn't know. She just kept insisting she didn't want to talk about it. I just need to call him back. I can spare you all the details other than to say, my brother called pretending to be a proctologist and wanted to talk about the, the anti-itch cream he had prescribed for me. <laughs> I could have killed him. Those of you who know my brother are well acquainted with his outrageous sense of humor and many of them have been on the receiving end of his wit. However, that is only a small part of who Peter is. He is also a truly gifted businessman. He worked his way up from being a salesman at ProTech, a nationally known company that manufactures custom cab guards and toolboxes for semis, to being the CEO of the company. He's also first vice chairman of the board of the NTEA, the Association of the Work Truck Industry, and next year, he is slated to take over as chairman of the board. Let's just say he is highly respected by those who work in the world of truck manufacturing. However, it is not his over-the-top sense of humor or his giftedness as, as a businessman that best defines who he is. The core of Peter's life is his walk with Christ. He has a deep, unshakable faith in God, and he is not shy about sharing it with anyone he meets. Whether it's the people he works with or those he meets on plane flights or those who wait on him in restaurants as he travels all over the country on business, he is always looking for ways to be the light of Christ to others. You could say that Peter is my hero. 
which in itself is proof of God's redeeming power. I mean, how else can you explain that the torpy little brother I used to tease without mercy is now one of my heroes? Do you understand how Peter's life was the inspiration for the verse I'm preaching on today? We have to go back approximately four years. Peter was part of a delegation from the NTEA that traveled to Germany for a 10-day trip to meet their German counterparts. On the first day, one of the people on the trip my brother didn't know, Bart, came up to him and said, You're Peter Miller. I've heard about you, and I want to spend the next 10 days hanging out with you. I want to get to know you better. Peter thought to himself, sure, why not? And that's exactly what happened. They spent the rest of the trip hanging out together and building a relationship. Now, what is really remarkable about the encounter is that it is out of character for both of them. Bart said later he had never done anything like that before, and his family couldn't believe it when he told him how he approached Peter. Peter told me afterwards his normal response would have been to put his guard up and wonder about the guy. Instead, he felt perfectly at ease at the suggestion they hang out together. Bart is from a Catholic background and told Peter he wanted to attend church the next day and invited him to join him. So they ended up attending a Catholic mass spoken completely in German. Peter said later, it was beautiful. Worship is worship, no matter the language. Now, Peter and Bart did not become best friends after the trip. Peter lives in Tennessee and Bart lives in Ohio, but they did remain acquaintances through work and they had contact with each other three to four times a year due to business. Last November, they were both at a luncheon for a work function and they had a chance to sit together. During that lunch, Bart opened up to Peter about a heavy burden he had been carrying. His son, Patrick, who was in his early 40s, was in desperate need of a kidney transplant. For unknown reasons, his kidneys had begun to fail and had been functioning at 50% capacity for the past seven to eight years. Now they had all but ceased to function and Patrick was undergoing several hours of dialysis four days a week. During that time, he'd also gone into cardiac arrest three to four times due to the buildup of fluid around his heart. Now, with no one else in the family as a suitable donor, Patrick was waiting to hear if he could be the donor for his son. In fact, during that lunch, he was waiting for a call to let him know. A call did come in later that afternoon to tell him they would let him know in about two weeks. At first, the news was good. Bart was a match to Patrick. Bart saw this as nothing short of a miracle. You see, even though he had raised Patrick for most of his life, he was actually his stepfather. And he, but he considered himself to be his father, and he was thrilled to know that by donating a kidney to Patrick, they really would be actual flesh and blood. He and his wife gave thanks to God for this answer to prayer. Unfortunately, the good news didn't last. Once it came out that Bart had kidney stones in the past, he became ineligible to donate. I recently reached out to Bart, even though I have never met him, and asked him what the turn of events did to his faith. He was so sure God was performing a miracle, and then it was all taken away from him. His response was, wow, great question. Shocked, unbelieving, disappointed, angry, embarrassed, and then acceptance. I was called by the hospital nurse with the news of my rejection. I begged, but they told me the kidney stones were game over for me. You see, I myself have been diagnosed with cancer about eight years ago, but I'm cancer free now. But it was at that time when it hit me, I needed to walk the walk in my faith. So after accepting the news of my rejection as a donor, we went into prayer mode for someone to come into our lives. When Bart called Peter with the news, Peter told him he would pray for Patrick, and that is what Peter did. He took it to God in prayer. Here's where the part of listening to the Spirit comes into play. Peter will tell you he heard God speaking to him, not in an audible voice, but in as close as you can come to a voice being audible, God told him, it's not enough for you to pray. I want you to give him a kidney. Now you have to understand that, that at that point, Peter had sent in a urine sample that had determined he might be a match, but blood work and other tests would have to be done to determine for sure. And as it turns out, even when you find a compatible match for a live organ donation, there's a rigorous screening process involved and over 50% of the people who initially qualified to donate don't make it through the rest of the screening. So it was a pretty bold move on Peter's part for him to call Bart before he was even confirmed to be a match and tell him, just so you know, I'm donating a kidney to your son. Bart was very gracious and thanked Peter for his willingness to look into being a donor, but Peter told him, look, 
I don't think you understand. I'm not just looking into being a donor. God told me, I am the donor. I'm giving Patrick a kidney. This began a process that took several months and involved trips to Ohio for testing and meetings with doctors, counselors, and social workers. With each test, with each hurdle, it became more and more clear that Peter was indeed a match. He passed all the physical tests and he was cleared to donate. Peter still hadn't met Patrick, but his sisters and parents made a video and sent it to Peter. They all took turns sending messages to him about how he was such an answer to prayer. They were blown away that a total stranger was making such a sacrifice for somebody he had never met. It was so important to them that he knew how much this meant to their family, how beyond grateful they were. So on Tuesday, July 16th, Peter traveled to the University of Ohio Medical Center to meet his surgical team, and more importantly, Patrick, for the first time. It hurt that Patrick was anxious to meet him. Patrick had been thinking, what do you say when you meet a stranger who is saving your life? They walked down the hall toward each other and Peter could see how nervous Patrick looked. So he stopped, opened his arms and said, so you want a piece of me? This is quickly followed by laughter and hugging. <laughs> While there that week, they met with a surgeon who explained about genetic markers. There are six genetic markers they look for in matching donors and recipients. It was explained that blood brothers who had each received the exact same set of chromosomes from both their mom and their dad might be a six out of six match, but even that wasn't always the case. Turns out that Patrick and Peter were a match on five out of six, and they were a partial match on the sixth. At that point, Patrick's mom said to Peter, that is confirmation from God. It was always meant to be you. While they were there, Peter and his wife was able to go out to dinner with Patrick, his wife, his parents, and his sisters. The theme of the evening turned out to be, who does that? It was the statement repeated more than once by Patrick's family when talking about Peter and what he was about to do. Later, as they all returned to the hotel, they were walking past the pool and Patrick's sister was so overcome with excitement, she jumped fully clothed into the pool. Three weeks ago, on Monday, July 29th, my brother checked himself into the medical center. As they wheeled him on a gurney past the family in the waiting room, he waved at them with jazz hands before being taken down the hall. Once again, the family turned to each other and asked, who does that? What kind of person can be so joyful when making such a sacrifice? Who does that? Of course, the answer to that question is, a Christ follower who allows the spirit to lead them does that. Finally, the big moment arrived and Peter went through the surgery, gave up a kidney, and he was transplanted into Patrick. Once transplanted, the kidney started working immediately. Afterwards, the surgeon told them they were amazed at the large size of the donated kidney. They even wondered how they were going to fit it into Patrick. You see, Patrick is both taller and heavier than my brother, and a big guy will do much better with a larger kidney. Further proof that God is in all the details. The family and doctors are happy to report that Patrick is doing really well. In fact, right after the surgery, he was putting out a liter of urine every hour. That's kind of a big deal because his body hadn't produced any urine in quite some time. and was fantastic. He was finally able to rid his body of all the excess fluid that had been building up. I'm also extremely happy to report, extremely happy to report that my brother is doing very well. His recovery is coming along just as it should. However, the most exciting part of this story is the way other people are reacting to it when they hear it. With each retelling, God is being glorified and people are seeing God's hand at work through the entire journey. Bart, for one, has been busy telling everyone he meets about the amazing thing that God did. It is not an overstatement to say that Peter not only gave Patrick his life back, but his actions have planted seeds that will undoubtedly lead others to finding eternal life through Christ as well. When I told Peter I wanted his permission to tell his story in my sermon, he replied, of course. And the verse you have to use with it is Galatians 6.10. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. It had become the verse that he lived by during this entire process, and he shares it with anyone who hears about what he did. So what's the takeaway for all of us here today? Do we all have to go out and become organ donors to fulfill the command of that verse? Of course not. Peter's story is a pretty amazing one, but it's only one example of how someone could do good to others. And it's an extreme example at that. As I said earlier, look around you. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you how you can be a blessing to others. 
I know each person here could probably stand up and tell of the many times someone has done something good for them. I think at the time we bought our house, it was an extreme fixer up and we didn't move in for the first month because of all the work we need, it needed. Every day we'd go to work, drop our girls off at grandma's and then spend every night repairing, painting and fixing up the house, sometimes until two or three in the morning. The next door neighbors who we hadn't even met yet started parking one of their cars in our driveway so it looked like someone was living there and would be thieves would leave it alone. And other nights they would show up while we were working late and bring us hot chocolate and snacks to keep our spirits up. And after all the work of getting the house ready, we were too exhausted and had no time left to pack up our own rental house to make the move to the new house. Friends came alongside us and packed up our entire house for us. Let me tell you, it's a real lesson in humility to have someone else go in and pack up your closet for you if you keep your closet the way I keep mine. After the move, I went back to the rental house to do a few last minute things, only to find someone had taken all seven full trash cans we had left for pickup, dumped the trash on the driveway, and stolen the trash cans. This was after the single longest month of my life. I was beyond exhausted, both physically and mentally. I was actually ready to break down and start crying right there in the middle of my driveway. At that point, my friend Scott pulled up in his truck. He just wanted to check on me to see how things were going. He was like an angel sent from God. He went to his house, gathered up as many trash cans as he could find, helped me clean up all the trash from the driveway, loaded the cans in his truck, and he helped me find a dumpster to put everything in. Just the week before last, we had the folks here from Windshape running an amazing camp for our kids. They poured themselves into the kids all week. They kept them moving the entire time and taught them all about the love of our never changing God. But the camp couldn't have happened without the army of volunteers from this church that came alongside the windshape workers. They gave up their time to love on those kids and serve in any way they could. My wife Paula was part of a truly dedicated team that included Doug and Naomi Tozier and Patsy Pro that made dinner and served it to the 25 members of the windshape crew every single night. For the windshape workers, we were the last stop after doing the camps for the past five weeks. At each stop, they would bring their laundry from some, and someone from the church they were working at would have to wash it for them. Each worker had their own bag of laundry. They all had to be washed as individual loads to keep each person's clothes separated. We're talking about 25 loads of laundry that had to be washed in one night. I'm so proud of the Christ First people who stepped up and willing to take laundry home. We'd had people who committed to taking three bags home but only had to take one because there were so many people who volunteered. And if that wasn't enough, Jeff Fairley, who I'm proud to say is a member of my community group, took home the laundry from a young man who had his clothes in a plastic garbage bag. He was the only one who had had his clothes in a garbage bag. Everyone else had a cloth laundry bag. Well, Jeff took the clothes home, washed them, folded them, and returned them in a cloth laundry bag. The young man was blown away and overcome with gratitude for Jeff's act of kindness, truly. Jeff was acting as the hands and feet of Christ to that young man. I could go on and on. I have seen so many acts of kindness over the years, and I know you all have as well. In fact, I told James that one of these Sundays, we should skip the sermon and just spend time sharing all the ways we've seen Christians showing love to others. I know it would bless the socks off of everyone in the room if we did so. But let me wrap this up with a devotional written by pastor and author Charles Swindoll. The ancient prophet Micah isn't exactly a household word. Too bad. Though obscure, the man had his stuff together. Eclipsed by the much more famous Isaiah who ministered among the elite, Micah took God's message to the streets. Micah states exactly what many, to this day, wonder about pleasing God. Teachers and preachers have made it so sacrificial, so complicated, so extremely difficult. To them, God is virtually impossible to please Therefore, religion has become a series of long, drawn-out, deeply painful acts designed to appease this peeved deity in the sky who takes delight in making us squirm. Micah erases the things on the entire list, replacing the complicated possibility with one of the finest definitions of simple faith. He has told you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God, Micah 6, 8. God does not look for big time displays. What is required? Slow down 
Read the list aloud to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God, period. In other words, so then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who have the household of faith. Let's pray.